Has anybody got a prayer request? Amen. So is she. Yeah, I remember Kathy, she hadn't been in a while. Anyone else? Quest others. Amen. Remember that request. Any others? Amen. Remember that. I also remember Joyce and Bruce. Talked to Joyce the other day, yesterday, I think it was. Uh, needs our prayers. They ain't got nothing on him yet. They've done some tests where they go in your back and do the fluid thing. That, uh, the results ain't come back yet. So, don't know anything. Remember Janice when you pray. Anybody else? Amen. Remember, continue to remember David. Amen. Remember our Bible study in our church. Time's growing short, church. It's running out. All right, anybody else? All those have unspoken requests, if you would. Everybody that will, let's come in and pray for the needs of the church and pray for the needs of those going through bereavement and sickness. All right, we'll be starting in Revelation chapter 16, verse 16 tonight. And 
he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Boy, that word, you hear that word a lot, don't you? Armageddon. Armageddon is a Hebrew word. It's talking about the Valley of Megiddo. I've been to the Valley of Megiddo. You can look, stand on top of Mount Carmel and look down, and it's a luscious valley. It's farmland. It's right over next to the, one of the Air Force bases in Israel. And it's about a 200-mile, 160-mile, I think it is, valley. can't remember how wide it is, but they call it the perfect battlefield. And that's going to be the last big battle on earth. And it's going to be between Jesus Christ, His church, which is us, His angels. You've heard the second coming, right? The second coming... The first coming is when he came through the womb of a virgin named Mary as a baby. The second coming is when he comes with his saints, the church in heaven on horses. And he ride, we ride through the valley of Megiddo, which they call the Battle of Armageddon, all the way to Jerusalem. He defeats his enemies. The blood is spatter up to the horse's bridle. The Antichrist will be taken care of, the false prophet will be taken care of, the devil will be chained in a bottomless pit for 1,000 years. At the end of that 1,000 years, he'll be let loose. That's the second coming. They're talking about that battle will be somewhere around 200 million troops, and they're under Satan's authority. Now, the world doesn't see the devil, but they do see the Antichrist. He'll be the devil in flesh, like Jesus was God in flesh, and he'll rule the world. And his purpose is that he is the one that talked the Muslim world into signing a seven-year peace treaty. But midway through that peace treaty, he breaks it and comes after Israel. Shows his true colors. And this is him simply wanting to annihilate the Jew, annihilate Israel, take the land, give it to, under his kingdom, and destroy anything that has anything to do with Yahweh God. Or Jesus Christ. He wants to eliminate just like Hitler did every Jew on the face of this earth plus their land. And so you have this final battle with all the troops that are under the authority of the Antichrist. But what they did not count on was Jesus coming out of heaven with his saints. And we don't do anything but ride behind him. He kills them with the sword of his mouth. He just speaks the word they die. So... They try to annihilate Israel, but Jesus actually annihilates them. So that's that final battle. That's the second coming of Christ. He stops the assault because what is it? He has a forever covenant with Israel. They will always be his people. He will always be their God. That land shall always belong to God. God holds the deed and the title to that land, and the Antichrist will not take it away from God. But here's the thing about it. It's assault on Israel. It's going to be a United Nations and a World Council. It will be a political decision. The World Council has nothing to do with the economics. They don't have anything to do with the religious movement, but they do have everything to do with the political movement. And if you paid any attention to history and news, they rule against Israel 100% of the time. United Nations hates them. World Council hates them. They barely got in. NATO to start with. People just hate Jews. God said they would because of my name. And you'll find the Antichrist has summoned all of his ten, ten kings and the armies under his authority and there's a united last effort to push the Jews into the sea and annihilate them completely. We've already seen this in 20 and 24, have we not? Have they not tried to take Israel and Netanyahu to court and put him in prison for defending his people? And they voted overwhelmingly he's a war criminal. So everything that you see in the news, it's just going to amp up in the tribulation period because the church will be gone, the Holy Spirit's gone, God is up in heaven, there'll be nothing, nothing to curb the Antichrist, the devil will have full power and authority down here. Verse 17, And the seventh angel poured out his vial, seven angels, into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. 
if you take the word it is done and put them with the word it is finished, where did you hear the words it is finished? And you hear the words here it is done means this is the seventh angel, it's the final angel, it's the final judgment, there's no more judgments to pour out, it's done. God's wrath has been poured out on a wicked world. And just as Jesus, the sin debt was paid, it is done. There's nothing else that can be done that we can be saved. The sin debt's paid in full. His blood was shed in full. Everything was done. There was nothing else he could do. So he pours it out into the air. Do y'all remember the ten plagues of Egypt? What was the sixth plague? Moses took the ashes and did up into the air and then boils came, correct? Yeah. Preacher Bobby, he did. He sprinkled ashes into the air, boils appeared, the seventh and final vial before the second coming. He says it is done. It is done. There's nothing else to do. But here's the thing about it, that this, the seventh angel doesn't pick out a particular target. You notice the other angels, it'll be the ocean. The other angels, it'll be the fresh water. The other angels, it'll be a third of this. It will be on man, it'll be on animals, it'll be in the air. This one here, he, just, he doesn't specify anything. He just throws it up into the air and says, it's done. The angel doesn't pick out a particular position nor a target. He pours out his vial over the entire earth. Look at verse 18. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. What does that tell you? Is it not an astrological storm? Is it not tell you that for a Bible who has been around before creation that takes us back to the very creation, if there was ever a record of earthquakes kept, and the Bible that knows every one of them and says this, there's never been one this bad before. You can go back in history, go on the Weather Channel and the, the Science Channel, and you'll find different earthquakes that have been mapped out and listed and shown. There's some devastations on some earthquakes. But the Bible says nothing has ever been seen before as bad as this one. So, it's an astrological storm. It's the biggest earthquake ever in the history of mankind. If you look at the Bible, what two times does the Bible specifically say there was a great earthquake? New Testament. Come on, one happened at the death of... And then it happened again three days later at His resurrection. Now, that was God pouring out His wrath on the earth at the crucifixion, but that was God's alarm clock on that Sunday morning when He shook and rattled the earth right good and kept it to Jerusalem. But here's what happens. and We're going to read, we're going to read this, and you'll see in verse 19, and it'll describe it better in verse 19, is that the earth is going to be split in places. All the cities will be in ruins. Babylon, and we'll get into Babylon here in a little bit, will be split into three parts. Now, let me ask you a question. We seem to think that earthquakes, and we're told that they just run in fault lines, Correct? Do you not think God has the authority and the ability to crack this earth anywhere and any way He chooses to? Can He not specifically split the Babylon system into three parts of that city? Can He not split Jerusalem into different places? Can He not take anywhere in the world and open it where He wants to and stop it when He wants to stop it? Because He is in charge. Tremendous loss of life. Think about this. Jobs are gone, right? Not only that, workplaces, there's no place to work. Your jobs are gone. Farms, where are you going to grow? Right now, right now the majority of, of the world depends on commercial farms. That's why the quality of food is junk. That's why if you, don't, if you ain't wanting to pray over your food, you better not take another bite. 
And I want to tell you why. It's not just where they make it. It's not where they cook it and, and all this. You have no idea when you order fruit and vegetables from a foreign country what's happened to that before you got it. They don't have the standards we do, and our standards stink. Do you hear me? They're letting stuff go into the food that we eat and buy at the grocery store that ain't got no business in it. And that's America. You should have seen some of the, some of the places that food, fruit and vegetables from Mexico, Guatemala, all around the world, how they're grown and what they used to grow them with. I ain't going to tell you in here. But I'm telling you, you better start praying over your food. Let me go on. Farms are gone. Roads are gone. How do you get anywhere? The economic system is gone. There's no way to earn a living. It doesn't matter if you got the mark of the beast or not. There's nothing to buy. There's no money to spend. And God's doing it with natural disasters. People's worried about the third world war. People's worried about aliens coming. They better start worrying about God Himself. No deliveries. I'm a retired truck driver. I made a living delivering. There won't be any deliveries to make. There'll be nobody to deliver anything to because there'll be nothing to deliver. Hospitals, they're gone. Now, I'm going to tell you all something. We give hospitals down the road. We give this one down the road. You know we do. Where would we be if we didn't have any? Think about it. Doctors are gone. Travel's gone. Foundations are gone. Let me tell you something. You can talk about foundations all you want to, but every foundation is built on the foundation of this earth. You hear me? There ain't no other way to build nothing except on the earth. Gone. When God shakes the world, airports are gone. By the way, in New Zealand, if anybody's going to New Zealand, you can only hug whoever's leaving that plane for three minutes now. Just... Telling you, you better get your hugs in before you get to the New Zealand airport. Limit. Three minute hugs is all you get. That's the truth. That's the news. They'll break it up. Verse 19, please. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nation fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of, his, of the wine of his fierceness of his wrath. That great city, we're talking about Babylon. We're going to get into Babylon in chapter 17 big time. Well, we've got tribulation. We've got the cup of his wine, of his fierceness. We've got his wrath. Why do you suppose God uses cup of wrath? In the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus said, not my will, but they done, but Father, if there's any other way that you can take this cup, what was in the cup? Every sin of mankind plus the wrath of God, the wrath of the devil, and the wrath of the wicked. All that was poured out on the Lord Jesus at the cross of Calvary. He was whipped for something he did not do, but he took mine and yours punishment so that we could have salvation. And it just aggravates me to no end when people don't truly, Christians, saved people, don't truly appreciate what Jesus did on the cross. We get caught up in so much other junk in the church that we forget what a sacrifice He made for me and you. Anytime. And I'll tell you something, He don't need us, but we do need Him. We need to get back down to basics in the New Testament church, and that's lifting up the name of Jesus. And quit all this worldly foolishness. Oh, God's wrath, no mercy. Did God pour out, did God, did God show Jesus, His Son, any mercy on the cross of Calvary? None. Matter of fact, that Jesus said, My God, my God, why did thou forsake me? Verse 
fierceness, savage, lying. It's a violent, like a tornado. When he talks about the cup of wrath, you ever seen a tornado? A tornado don't care. It goes. And wherever it goes, it's destructive. And that's what the fierceness of God's wrath when He pours it out in humanity is. They're about to see a side of God they did not ever believe existed. Because all you hear out of these little weak backbone preacherettes is God's love, God's love, God's love. Yes, God is love, but God's judgment too. And God will whip you and judge you. Amen. Because he's going to do this. A tornado, or something that boils over, is meant to destroy. What's God doing with all this? He's tearing down and breaking up everything the devil built up in this world and called his own. This world does not belong to the devil. God built it for you and me. So, God's going to tear the devil's little playhouse down. And the devil didn't build the world, but in the tribulation period, he did build the economical system, did he not? Yep. Did he not build this religious system? Did he not build the political system? Let me ask you a question. Can you not look around and see all three systems in effect in the world we live in? Can you not see a wicked religious system with cults? Can you not see a wicked economical system built on briberies and lies? But can you not also see a crooked political system? You better amen that. Look at verse number 20. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God, because the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Y'all ever been hit with a hailstone? It hurts. I'm talking about this size. The islands. Do you believe even in our generation, a lifetime, that God has formed islands that didn't exist 50 years ago? Y'all ever seen Hawaii? All that molten lava comes out of the earth, got to go somewhere, and it makes islands. But I want to get this God's rearranging the earth, and He can do that, can He not? Islands are gone. Mountains are not found. The earth was made flat. Can I ask you this question? Have you ever studied the earth before the flood of Noah? Is that a yes or a no? Do you believe mountains existed before the flood of Noah or was everything pretty much flat with a few hills? Pardon? All right. Are they mountains such as we have today? Or did they increase? Okay. We're good now. How did they increase? The flood, like, let's just go with our little valley, Grand Canyon. Receding waters dug down. That makes mountains taller. The earth is still in a cooling period. They rose up somewhat. There were mountains. You find them throughout the Old Testament, but not to the height that we have now. But it's been scientifically proven that when the waters receded, they took everything that was loose and deepen the valleys. If you got a deeper valley, that makes the mountain higher. Let me, to, let me ask you this now, since we're on a roll. Seasons. Winter, spring, summer, fall. Four of them, right? Did the seasons show up before at creation, or did the seasons show up after the flood? 
Huh? That's a great question. We're just looking for an answer. Fish. Fish. Post flood, pre flood. There was no seasons pre flood. You can tell him he's right right now in front of the church if you want to. <laughs> I'm just saying. No, the Bible never speaks of flood. The Bible of uh, seasons till after the flood. It never speaks of deep valleys and stuff like that. Here, here's what here's what it is. Before the flood happened, the world was in an atmospheric stagnant, if you would. There was a canopy of vapor overhead. There was water underneath, and God kept it pretty much the same year round. It never rained because it was watered from below, and heavy dew fell every day. But once God opened up the heavens, released the water that He stored up there, and brought it from the fountains of the deep, He flooded the world. And so therefore, we started after the flood, we started having seasons. It's in the Bible. All right, let's get to the hailstones. Now this is where I can't answer this to say nothing because of the information. How much, how much is a talent? Said the hailstones would weigh that much of a talent. How much does a talent weigh? And if you've ever looked that up, it will drive you crazy because depending on what source you look at, it goes anywhere from 18 pounds to 100 pounds. 81 pounds is average. Just saying. Depends on the source that you look up at. Eight, I said 18. 8 pounds, 10 pounds to 100 pounds. I looked every source I could find, and that's what I got. Well, let's just go with 100 pounds. That is one more big bowling ball, is it not? You have recorded instances of hailstones being so big they've actually went through the house, through the roofs of houses. They've destroyed cars. They've killed people. There's some that are softball size that are recorded that they got pictures of it. Imagine the destruction with hailstones. Just say they're a hundred pounds. Just say they're eighteen pounds. Just say whatever they are. Imagine falling out of the sky. They're going to destroy everything. They'll tear up roads, houses. You couldn't stand it. And what he's saying, the seventh plague of Egypt, was it not uh, hell? Men, and here's the thing, after hell and after the earthquakes, they, they blaspheme God. Blaspheme God. How wicked and hard-hearted do you have to be to go through devastation like that, complete destruction? You've seen the devastation in North Carolina. What would it sound like to you if you would witness people give a news conference and they're just cussing God with the foulest language because the flood came? Would that make sense? Is it possible that maybe there were some that did? We don't know that. But imagine the worst destruction the world and mankind has ever seen and all they want to do is, is curse at God. They brought it on themselves. They could have repented, but they still blame God. How much of the world today blame God for the flood in North Carolina? Do you understand what I'm saying? What the world does not understand, and I want you to get this, destruction that you saw on the news firsthand is that close to you and me without God's protective hand. This world is kept in check by God's hand. And every once in a while, He'll lift that hand and show you what could happen, what the possibility is, if we don't surrender our life to Him. That is just a small little taste, as bad as it was with the loss of life and property of what is going to happen in the tribulation period. So, they bite the lightning and the hell. Nothing softens their heart, nor does anything seem to draw people close. Can I ask you a question? If you've ever witnessed to people in the last five years, 
does it not seem like no matter what you present, how you present it, what you say, what Bible verse you use, what story you tell, it has no effect on their heart. They just don't want to hear it. And the world, mankind, is going to get even worse. And nobody has got a better message for mankind than the church. Let's go to chapter 17. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Verse 2. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. All right, the angel is inviting John to witness the judgment. He's inviting John to witness the punishment. And I've got to be so very careful how I present this, because I know I'm in the house of God. I know the Bible language, but I also know I'm going to have to teach the truth. So let's see how this goes. He invites John to witness the judgment and the punishment of the great prostitute. Now, let me just say this much about it. The word prostitute in the Bible means exactly what you think it does. That meaning hasn't changed. It's someone that offers a service for money, greed, and lust, and nothing to do with love. Does the Bible not say God so loved the world? Does the Bible not say that God loves us as a groom loves his bride? That's the difference between a bride and a prostitute. Who or what is this great prostitute? The world has accepted. Let me give you this meaning. It means someone that shows affection or attention for money and not love. May I say this, that has more to do with physical, that more not to do with physical love than it does with everything else. When God mentions whoring, harlot, prostitute, He's talking about those who worship false gods. So don't put your mind in, in Las Vegas. Put your mind in the Bible here. And what he's saying is mankind went after the great Babylonian prostitute for their religion instead of to God for his religion and his love. And you're going to find, is that not what the world seems to be searching for? Do the world, How many times have you heard people say, I don't want the Jesus your grandmama had? And how many churches, air quotes, are offering the Jesus that our grandma didn't have. You hear what I'm saying? So, you're getting just a small taste that the Antichrist is going to offer a religious system that the world will embrace because it has nothing to do with Jesus, nothing to do with repentance, nothing to do with sin, nothing to do with living right. And that's what people are looking for in a church. They don't want to live right. They don't want the preacher to preach against any kind of sin. They don't want the preacher to preach against anything that they're doing wrong in their lifestyle. They want to come to church, have a good rock and roll song, have people say something nice, never to, never preach the Word of God and, and good solid Christian living and so they can feel they don't have to feel bad because nobody preaches against what they're doing wrong in their life. That's what they're looking for. That's what the Antichrist will offer. The church is God's bride. He loves his church and gave himself for it. Let me just say this you will never treat you should never treat your wife and this is this goes into, into homes now. You should never treat your wife with the same ideas you see women being treated on TV and movies. Am I here? Do you hear me? She is not your prostitute. She is your bride. You treat her like one. Too many people watch too many wrong kind of movies. They get these ideas in their head and they try to bring it home and it ain't happening. 
Now, that's about as graphic as I can get with the congregation I got, but one day it's going to get a lot more clear. Amen, Preacher Bobby. Preach it, brother. Never mind, I just had to calm myself down, son. He loves the church. The Antichrist has no love. He only takes, he lies, and he uses. A bride marries. Do you hear me? A bride marries. Not shack up. Not take it for a test drive. You commit. Fornication, the definition of that is illicit, illegal, and without love. Is it possible for two people to get married for the wrong reasons and they find out there's no love in their relationship? Oh, it happens. Most of the time, it's after you say, I do. And what I'm getting at, I'm trying to tell you the difference between God's love, how He treats His bride, how He treats His church, and how the Antichrist is going to treat the false religion. Right? Okay. Y'all are starting to look just a little peaked on me. You see, they have created a religious system that has no love to it. It's sinful. It's associated with pagan idolatry. It's a relationship that has been built on lust and not love. And if you want to know why marriages fall apart, they were built on the wrong foundation. Amen, Preacher Bobby. I feel like we're doing some marriage counseling tonight. Drunk. Drunk means the same thing no matter, no matter what you're talking about. It's an excess. Is there a difference? It's all wrong, but is there a difference between drinking and drunk? Drinking is on the way to drunk. Drunk is when you don't quit drinking. What he's talking about is with this harlot, this prostitute, he's talking about they were in it 100% till there was no, they, they couldn't see anything but what they're involved in. Is it possible to get involved in a false religious belief system and you're so deep into it you can't see the truth no matter which way you look? That's what he's talking about. They're going to believe it's the real thing. We have that popping up all over, even in Campbell County. And for the life of me, with as many churches as we've got that are still preaching the truth, how can people fall for that? But they do. And it really hurts when it's your kids or my kids and grandkids. Excess to the point that nobody has control over their actions. Let me give it to you like this. How many wives have heard this? Honey, I wouldn't have never done that had I not been drunk. Y'all heard it. You know what I'm talking about. Does that the end of their drinking? It won't be with this religious system. They have got in it such excess they can't even think for themselves anymore. When you are under the influence of alcohol or pills, you are no longer in control of your thoughts. And whatever controls your thoughts controls your body and your actions. And this, that mouth. Wine is simply a symbol of an intoxicating substance. Verse number 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Woman, what is she a symbol of? False church. Right? Is bride not the symbol of the true church? Is there a... Get me now. Is there a difference between woman and bride? Yeah. Yeah. They both got to be female. Well, until 2024, they don't, but you understand what I'm saying. But according to the Bible, a bride is one who is committed to marry. 
to marriage. Okay, that's a false church. Wilderness, we're referred to as the bride. The wilderness is simply, is simply a desert place. Do you understand that the devil likes to put his false churches where there's no strong influence next door? They come in, and what happens at these places? I've seen them on TV. I've never been in one. Number one, they bring you inside, and as soon as you stuck through the door, they got something on a big screen or something blaring from the speakers. They take control of your mind the moment you walk in that place. No influence, because they don't want you thinking about your other church. They don't want you thinking about any other word, any other influence. They want to completely control your mind because once they got you under control, they can feed you anything they want to and you have a better chance of believing it if they control you when you first come in the door. If you go in a place and you're thinking, man, I just don't know about this place. They just fill your head full of all their junk and so you can't really have a good thought in your head. That's how they control you. Now, sitting on a scarlet beast, bright red symbolizes blood. Beast. This beast here represents the world government. What is, how is the Antichrist going to control the world? Through the law. Rules. How did he control the church in 2019? Rules. COVID was just simply the vehicle that they used and said it has to be this way. That's what got them to pass all these rules and these laws that you can't go to the house of God because you'll die, you'll spread to COVID. But it was the laws that people lived under that kept them out of church. He is going to have laws that keep you under His complete control. You won't think for yourself anymore. It's filled with blasphemous names. Seven heads. Talks about the, seven, the prominent rulers in Rome. Ten horns is ten kings. But what we got to understand, the Antichrist to get his world church and his economical movement is going to rule it out of Rome. It's already, they've already got the the highway to reach everything. There's nothing bigger in this world than the Catholic Church. Don't go saying that, preacher. Bobby said all Catholics were under that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying he's just going to use their roadway. He's going to use what routes they've already got. They're in every little small village in the world, much less the big cities. It's already in place. Look at verse number... Yeah, we got time. Verse number four. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. All right. Let's look at big religious decorations. Have you ever seen how some of the non-Baptist faiths, faiths such as some on the world system, such as you see popes and cardinals, how are they arrayed? Pretty bright, right? And so she's into a religious, she's adorned similar. Purple is royalty. Scarlet is bright red. Gold is precious stones, pearls, and represents Riches, vain, vain beauty. Jezebel. What does the Bible tell us about a church that simply wants to be represented by their worldly riches? You ever seen the difference between a Baptist country church and a cathedral? Have you ever seen some of the Catholic churches around the world? Gold, marble, it's about the building. This building is about the Savior. It ought to be nice. We ought to keep this as just pristine as we possibly can because it's God's house. But it's never about the building. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And, it, and this building requires money to keep the lights on, to keep the furnaces working, and to keep it going. You've got to have that. We know that. But it's never about making the building more important than the Savior. But you see the difference between this? What about a million dollar pipe organ? Boy, they're nice. What about solid gold in the vessels that are used? What about the expensive clothes that are worn in in pursuit of the worship service? Do you understand Jesus never represented royalty in His first coming and in His earthly ministry? He stayed away from royalty. Now, He's the King of kings, but He's coming back and you're going to see some royalty then. Let me just go ahead. I'm probably already in all kinds of trouble. False ritualistic churches of modern day, she reveals a false religion that prostitutes the truth. Let me use that word one more time and I'm going to try to get it behind us. Have you ever heard a preacher say, and I've said it many times, about prostituting the gifts of God? What am I talking about? Let's just say you got a great singing voice. Are you going to use that voice to make money selling country, selling rock, selling some type of a gospel, something or another to make yourself rich and elevate you above God? Great speaking voices. Great talents that God gives all of us. Do we use it for the glory of God or do we use it to lift our own self up? Do you see what I'm saying? That is prostituting the gifts of God is when you take the God-given gift that He gives every human being and you use it for your glory and your riches instead of build up the kingdom of God. All right, enough of that. She is dressed, represented by wealth as a queen or a rich harlot. You ever seen... Oh, let me just say this. I wish I could get away. People that have to flaunt their wealth. They've got to have seven or eight vacation mansions, 30 cars, jewelry and clothes that are handmade or whatever, just specifically designed for them, and they've got to flaunt it on the runway so everybody can see what they've got. This is what he's talking about with this harlot right here. She's flaunting the riches. Where does the riches come from? The riches come from the people that give. They give it back to the Antichrist, to his world system, and he turns around and he flaunts the riches. Are we supposed to... That's where you get your prosperity gospel. Let me ask you a question. Did God put us on this earth to represent him to get rich? Or did He put us on this earth to represent Him as a Savior to get people saved? Gold cup, Babylon, full of gnats. Not that one. Full of obscene and filthy sins and becomes the focus of God's rage. Here's the thing I'm getting at. We'll move on. People used to keep stuff like that hid. Now they flaunt it in front of everybody and they're not ashamed anymore. They are literally thumbing their nose at the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know if I have time to get this or not, but we'll get started on it. Look at verse number 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Babylon has become the source or the headquarters of the false religion. Going to uh, run some things past you. And we, now I don't think I've got time to do all that tonight. 
Yeah, I do. Why not? Uh, Josh, if you would put up there Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 15, please. Everything started. Who wants to tell me? I've had this discussion with Scott. It's me and him. How many wants to tell me when idolatry, false gods, false religion, and idol worship first showed up? Babylon. Tower of Babel. Nimrod, the first world empire. You're right. And it showed up again. That was under Nimrod, and it showed up again under Nebuchadnezzar all the way through his grandson Belshazzar. But notice this, Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods, and all the women that stood by a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt, and Pathros answered Jeremiah, saying, go to 16, please. We're going to go all the way through 18. As for the word that thou spokest unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. 17. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven. Notice that, queen of heaven. And to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of victuals, which is food, and were well, and saw no evil, 18, and we'll be done with that. But since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. Who's the queen of heaven? Ishtar. Well, who's Ishtar? A Babylonian female deity. Now, the first thing we need to establish is this. There are no female deities in heaven. Right? Everything is male. The only female deity that you hear about in heaven is put there by the Catholic Church when they pray to Mary. That's Mariology, and that ain't biblical. Ishtar. How does Ishtar have anything to do with the first word you got to in Revelation 17 and 5 is the word mother. What does mother represent? A beginning. The mother starts the family, right? She gives birth. Everything, everyone after the mother is the offspring, correct? So he's talking about the mother of Harlot. So how did all this start? Well, it started with Babylon and with Nimrod. It started with them introducing false gods, false deities, false worship, false idols, false sacrifices, and introducing it to the rest of the world, especially to God's people, Israel. What did they do to uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Was he not wanting them to bow down and worship a false idol? Were there not false gods going around at that time that they offered their food to? They were offering drinks. Here you got God's people are, are saying, it was better for us when we served her than when we serve God, right? Ain't that what they're saying? Is that not what much of America is trying to say today? That we've got it better serving our own self and our own lust of the flesh than trying to serve God? Because God limits everything I can do? Ah, oh, come on, I ain't done yet. Here's what happened. It was a cult that developed in the world it's in Assyria and it went throughout Egypt and had to do with Baal and had to do with Rome and had to do with Greece. It was worldwide. It was a cult developed and worshipped by offering wafers to the Queen of Heaven. Part of the celebration was... was let me ask you this question before I tell you that. Because this is going to tell you what it is. Of all the holidays in the world, this one is one that the world celebrates especially America and has grafted itself to the church. What do you suppose it is? Not Christmas. Easter. Remember that word, Easter. Do you know the root word of Easter? Ishtar. Do you remember going back to Babylon? 
Ishtar was introduced. Guess how they celebrated their ceremonies to Ishtar. They gave... Come on. Eggs. Why an egg? Egg is the symbol and represents the beginning of life. Eggs are made to hatch into little chickens and other birds. But people can't wait. They got to have their omelet so they get the egg before it hatches. What holiday has centers around eggs? Easter. The root word of Easter is Ishtar. It began by giving eggs to the female goddess Ishtar. And what do your New Testament churches do? We got Easter egg hunts. We got little bunnies that lay chocolate eggs. Do you see what I'm saying? The thing that the church has adopted along with the resurrection message is Easter Sunday. How many Christians even call it Resurrection Sunday anymore? Very few. And don't get me wrong, it ain't going to twist your kid up. It ain't. But do you understand how the church has adopted modern day things that started back in original Babylon and we have made it to seem so innocent and all the while we're bringing the false worship of a female goddess into the church belief. What happens on Easter? It does every Easter. Number one, the boy that won't ever go to church with his mommy goes to church with his mommy. Number two, usually the wife gets a new dress and the little girls get a new dress. Not always, but usually. That's when you have the, one of the biggest crowds in church is either Mother's Day or Easter Sunday because everybody feels guilty and they want to go to church with their mama on Easter. But the Saturday before Easter, you die and you hunt Easter eggs. And there's little bunnies and baskets. And we don't think nothing of it, do we? Once again, don't get me wrong. It ain't going to twist your kid. They're going to be fine. But you understand what I'm saying. It's stuff like that that sneaks into the New Testament church that's had a beginning in pagan idolatry. Well, let me just go ahead on. If I'm in it this deep, I'm in it all the way. Ezekiel chapter number 8, please. Ezekiel chapter number 8, verse number 13. He said also unto me, Turn, ye, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Verse 14, please. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Another idolatry God. Why is it people weep for most things in this world but Jesus Christ? Why do people not weep for the salvation of their own family? Why are they worried more about some country music stars getting the, getting the COVID than they're worried about salvation? You hear what I'm telling you? Go ahead and go back if you would, Josh. We're pretty much done. You see, we know all about the Tower of Babel. We know about Nebuchadnezzar. We know about the idol and the statue. We know about the furnace, seven times hotter. We know about the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We know about the Lord Jesus Christ going into the furnace and protecting them. But what you've got to understand, and I want to say this right here, and I want to clear something up. All these, and there's a, such a push in America, ancient aliens. You know, they're the ones that made mankind. They're the ones that taught how to build the pyramids. They're the ones that taught Egypt everything they know. Ancient aliens are the ones that taught everybody. May I tell you, there's no ancient aliens. Number one. 
Number two, when you read your Bible and you read about civilizations and cultures from thousands of years ago, and where all these false deities come from and how they manifest, it is fallen angels that take on personas that people believe in because they have such astounding powers they can do miraculous things. That's where all that came in. It's got nothing to do with aliens from other planets that taught us how to do nothing. And if you'd read your Bible, you'd know that. Sometimes I think the New Testament church is made up of toddlers because we have gotten so far away from studying this book where we'll know the difference between idiocracy and truth. Amen? Okay, if I mention two words to you, tell me what you think. Barbarian. You thinking of Conan? Yeah, he was. He's lit up, had his hand in there. In the Bible, a barbarian is somebody that does not speak the language of the land they find themselves in. That's all it is. It ain't Conan and some conquering Genghis Khan tribe. Alien. Let's just look at alien. Because I ain't going home with this running around in my head. Alien is not somebody from a former planet. I don't care how much these nutheads think that they found life on other planets. God put it on this one. Alien is somebody from a foreign country in another country that's not their country. That's exactly what aliens and barbarians mean. Study your Bible and you'll know these things and you'll quit believing the eggheads on the sci-fi channel. I'm going to tell you, I'm a firm believer in this. I'm a firm believer that the church is suffering for this reason, biblical ignorance. How do we get there? Number one, if you ain't got a pastor that teaches the Word of God straight from the Word of God, you can get ignorant. Number two, if you don't study the Bible yourself, you're going to be ignorant on the Bible. Amen, Preacher Bobby. All right then. Sometimes i got to amen my own self. Anybody got anything on you want to discuss? Any questions? Keep your criticisms to yourself. But we'll do the we'll do the conversations. <laughs> Hang on just a minute. I got a question over here. No, sir. In reality, the chicken came first. In the Garden of Eden, God gave them chickens, not eggs. It was the Easter Bunny and Nimrod that gave them the other one. Here's the thing about it. The Easter story, Bunny story and all that, has nothing to do with chickens, bunnies and eggs, and their chocolate. And that's such a big part of the church. The truth of it is, our kids, my kids, everybody's kids, grow up knowing more about the Easter Bunny side of that story than they do the resurrection side of Jesus Christ. That's just a, that's just a form that they came up with as a, a way to, to celebrate it. It's got nothing to do with the Bible, nothing to do with God, nothing to do with the church. It's just sort of like a cartoon, science fiction type thing. It's a story somebody had in their head, they presented it, it caught on. Santa Claus, why Santa Claus? Because somebody came up with a story about a big heavy set man in a red in a white suit with eight fine reindeers. Go, you're about to spasm. What did you talk? Which name? What word is it? Mystery. 
the mother of harlots. That's because of its significance. What you're, what you're seeing right there is you're seeing about how false gods, false idols, false worship, false sacrifices began and where it ended up at. It's very important to know why you believe what you believe because this right here would never have been in its position that it is in the tribulation and revelation had it not been for its inception and under Nimrod in uh, the original Babylon. Why do you think the Bible's referring to it in Revelation as Babylon? Babylon hasn't been an empire in thousands of years. We're under Rome. We haven't been under Babylon empire. The first time was Nimrod. The second time was Nebuchadnezzar. And it ended with Belshazzar. But that's the last of the Babylonian empire. But yet God compares the tribulation, the harlot, the mystery, and all that to what started in Babylon under Nimrod. Anything else? They right here where the mystery is solved in what we read in Jeremiah, and I tell you about Ishtar. That is the mystery. People don't understand it, do they? When you say it's a mystery, God, let me just put it this way: the entire Bible's a mystery, is it not? How do we get to the truth? The Holy Ghost unlocks the words. Let me give you an example I used multiple times. The devil quoted Scripture at the temptation of Christ. Jesus quoted Scripture at the temptation of Christ. Which one got the truth from the Bible? Jesus. The devil couldn't use He was powerless. He used the words. The words are, are, are not it. It's when you get the truth from the words. But it, it is a mystery because it doesn't self-explain. You've got to search for it. And the entire Bible is. Anyone else? Wrong number. Oh. Well, That was just one of the many different pagan holidays that had made their way into Jewish culture. Here's the thing about it. Paul was dealing with the Jews that wanted to keep the Old Testament laws and traditions along with the New Testament of faith. And he kept telling about that. And it had to do with Easter. It had to do with their, how they washed their hands, how they prayed over, over food. It had a lot. And they were, and they was, we used the word harlot and stuff tonight several times. That was part of that was part of temple worship at their, at the time, and Paul was dealing with that as well. So there was a lot of pagan stuff that started in First Babylon that continued throughout the years because people carry traditions; they don't do nothing else. And that's why Paul was dealing with that as part of everything else. The Easter that shows up in our Bible really isn't to, to do with the holiday Easter. It was a holiday that after Easter that Herod was going to arrest them. But what I was talking about tonight was the Easter and how pagan beliefs have integrated into the New Testament church. That more people know Easter than they do resurrection. Anyone else? All right, I'm give out. Let's stand our feet. Okay, y'all, y'all good? All right. And they lifted the holy hands towards heaven and they shouted.